At the end of my talk, if I am lucky, you guys are going to remember roughly half of what I'm about to say. And what's much worse is that you're actually all going to remember different halves. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Our brains are these incredible information processing machines, but in order to take in all this sensory data, they effectively have to just throw most of it away. As product leaders and as makers, we are almost always dependent on groups of people around us to help us bring a new product or a new feature into existence. And as we all know, one of the most difficult things about working with groups of people is just simply getting everybody onto the same page and agreeing on what it is we're going to build and how to build it. But if half of what is being said is being forgotten within an hour and the other half that is being remembered is being remembered completely differently by everybody, how in the world are we supposed to get to that agreement? Well, thankfully, millions of years of evolution and social reinforcement have given us this amazing tool that's almost as good as planting ideas directly in people's brains. And that tool is stories. Stories are by far the best way to organize diverse groups of people around a single idea. Now, this is almost certainly not news to anybody in this room. So why is it that we all have so much trouble using stories on a day-to-day -day basis? Why is it that none of us think that we are capable of building really great stories and using them on the fly in the middle of a meeting or in the middle of a presentation? Today, I hope that I can clear some of the myth about how stories are created and give you some really practical tips and tricks and tools that you can take away and use to build better stories that hopefully allow you to get more done much quicker and much easier. So let's get started. Actually, no, I think what we actually need to do first is to back up and talk about what types of stories we're really talking about here. And the type of story is actually a business parable. Now, parable, commonly the context is religious, but it certainly doesn't necessarily mean that it's a religious word. Um, a parable is just any story that tries to drive some specific behavior. And as team leaders or managers or owners of companies or products, you know that pretty much your entire job is about driving somebody's behavior to do something that you really want them to do. So story fitness is simply just a way of thinking about how effective a story is at driving behaviors. So what makes a story fit? Well, put plainly, fit stories almost always tick three boxes. The first is that the story has to be easy to understand. The message needs to be clear. If somebody has to ask you at the end of your story what the point was, it wasn't a very effective story, was it? Second, the story needs to be emotionally engaging. If someone, um, if your story either uses humor or shock value, that's fine, but something has to trigger that little dopamine response in the audience because that little response is what's actually going to help them to integrate that story into their own narrative. And lastly, the story has to be simple enough to be retold. What you want is your story to spread of its own accord around your teams and be retold often. A good way to think about this is that a story is an idea virus. And building story fitness is about giving your story the best chance of both delivering an effective message, but also becoming contagious and spreading. OK, so what can you do to help build the fitness of your stories? Well, first off, and perhaps most importantly, and we'll come back to this multiple times over the talk, is that it's actually much harder than you think to make a story too short. Here's an example. OK, so this might be an extreme example, but I show you this to, make it poss to, to show you that it is possible to get across a memorable message in just a few sentences. This little story about perseverance takes just 10 seconds to tell. But let's look at a little bit more of a real world example. Now, I'm not going to subject you to a dramatic reading of this story, but I have timed it, and it takes a minute and 46 seconds to tell. 
And to be honest, a minute and 46 seconds for a story, if it's effective, isn't actually that bad. But I think it could be easily improved. Here's a version of the story that took me just five minutes to edit down and retains all of the important information, but it only takes 52 seconds to tell. And so you can see with just a very small amount of upfront effort, we've been able to both make this story shorter and easier to understand, but also easier for people to retell because it's just less for them to remember. Again, it's really, really hard for us to retain information for very long. So making a story shorter makes it much easier for people to grasp what's actually being said or asked of them. So the next thing that makes a story fit is a focus on feelings rather than details. And Maya Angelou has this amazing quote that I really love that goes, people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. You need to ask yourself what you want the audience to feel when they hear your story. Do you want them to feel empowered? Do you want them to feel uh, pensive or cautious? It's this feeling that's actually going to help people to turn the story into something that's their own. And this is imp especially important in situations where you might be very familiar with the subject matter, but your audience might be seeing it either for the first time or might only be superficially aware of the details. Imagine you are in an important meeting with the entire exec team at your company. And there are two items on the agenda. Both of them are fairly large, fairly complex projects and would require quite a bit of investment. Each of these are being pitched by a different senior PM. In the first slot, the PM steps up and spends his entire 10 minutes showing charts and graphs and citing facts and figures to methodically build a case about why his project is really valuable and should be funded. In contrast, though, the second PM gets up there and spends her first six minutes painting a vivid picture of a poor office worker struggling valiantly against some horrible thorny problem. She then spends the next three minutes talking about a simple solution that would help ease this office worker's struggling and suffering. And finally, in the last minute, she puts up a single slide that has a few key figures and milestones on it. It's not hard to see which of those is going to be more impactful. Because the second PM told us not only what the project was about and why it should be funded, but told us more importantly why it actually mattered in the first place. And finally, fit stories are stories that are able to be adapted to the audience. Stand-up comics in specific are a really great example here. They spend months or sometimes even years building up their material in clubs that are specifically designed for going and trying out new stuff. And they get to see over all those reps and all that practice what works really well and what bombs. And slowly, through all those repetitions, they can build up kind of a, both a muscle memory for the content, but then also that gives them the ability to be much more relaxed about changing the content on the fly when they're in front of a, uh, a live audience. So for those of you who I can see in the audience starting to kind of tense up with anxiety about the idea of telling bad stories to people around you, here is a really simple tip that actually helped me get over this fear of you know, telling half-baked stories to people. If you find yourself in a situation where you're trying out a story and you feel like the story might be going long or you're losing the audience and you can see their eyes glazing over or they're starting to reach for their phones, just say, anyway, it's a really long story and stop there. It's important that second part. You have to just completely stop. Because what's going to happen there is that if the audience was actually interested in what you were saying, they're definitely going to ask you to continue. But if they don't say anything, you've saved everybody a bit of time, one, but you've also just learned that your story still needs a lot of work. On that note, it is important to remember that stories are never finished. Even really great stories have to evolve over time and evolve with each audience. Now, Given the very high achieving nature of people in this room, I know that you are going to be hard on yourself here. You have to give yourself permission to bomb when you're telling stories. You are going to tell plenty of really, really awful stories. The important thing is to try and learn from what went wrong in those stories and improve it the next time around. 
Okay, so now that we have an idea of the characteristics of really strong stories, I want to give you a kind of simple framework or formula for building business parables. Now, this is by no means the only way to construct a story, but it's a very simple one, and it's one that works very effectively in a work context. So the first thing is to start with the point. And that's because whether you know it or not, you, as soon as you start to hear a story, are asking yourself two questions. The first question is, why does this matter to me? And that question is all about relevance. And the second question is, could this have actually happened? And that one's all about plausibility. And if you've ever seen a Michael Bay film, you know that that second question is actually pretty easy for our human brains to sidestep. We are creatures that love to suspend disbelief. The first question, however, why does this matter to me, is a much harder question to sidestep. And so when you're in a context where you might be transitioning from a discussion or an argument about something to telling a story, you need to connect the dots for the audience and tell them what it is you're actually wanting them to get out of this right up front. <clears throat> the second part is to set context, to set the scene, but do it really quickly. This is one area where I'm actually really terrible most of the time. Um, my wife, who obviously has a vested interest in uh, my storytelling ability, mostly so she doesn't have to listen to bad stories, uh, constantly reminds me to get to the point when I'm starting to tell stories. It's easy to take way too long filling in too many details or giving too much backstory. Another thing that I find really fascinating about context as well, though, is that Paradoxically, the less information you give, the more rememberable a story will be, and the more vivid the picture will be. To see how this works, I'd like to do a quick example with you guys, or a quick little experiment. So I would like you to picture a farmhouse in the countryside, and the farmhouse is surrounded by fruit trees and flowers. And through the garden are two kids who are chasing after a dog. You guys have the picture in your head? Okay. So what's the architectural style of the farmhouse? And is the farmhouse in the middle of the mountains or is it on a flat plain? What's the geography around it look like? And what are the fruit trees and the flowers? Are they apples, pears? Are the flowers daffodils or daisies? And the kids that are chasing that dog, are they excited and happy and you know, laughing as they chase the dog? Or are they angry with the dog because the dog just robbed their soccer ball? My guess is that your brain's filled in loads of those details without me saying anything about them before. So giving less detail is actually often a better way to let people sort of put the picture together in their heads. The next thing you're going to want to do is to use dialogue. Dialogue, like not setting too many details, helps people to imagine a scene. It helps them to paint a, a picture of what's going on. And dialogue doesn't have to be between two people or more than one person. Internal dialogue is just as effective because the things that people think are often much more tangible than the things that they say out loud. Another hint about dialogue is to make the language really, really simple. Unless the character in your story is the type of person that likes to be that condescending jerk at the party, people just rarely use complicated words when they're talking to other people. So aim for simple language that's emotionally charged. The next and most important piece of any story or joke is the surprise or the punchline. Now, this doesn't have to be some shocking revelation or side-splittingly funny punchline. It just has to be something that's unexpected, something that sort of kicks the audience's brain into noticing that moment and latching onto it. Another thing that's important about this is that every other piece of the story really needs to be building towards the surprise and serving the surprise. A really easy way to shorten a story is just to go and find the point at which you've got the surprise or the climax of the story and work backwards and just cut anything that doesn't relate directly to that surprise. And then finally, once you've revealed the surprise, you need to restate your point. There's a lot of research out there that shows that by bookending a story or any sort of presentation with the message, recall is vastly improved. Each person in the audience, as I said at the very beginning, is going to walk away with slightly different details in your story. 
So restating that point at the end really does help to align people around what it is that you're asking from them, either a behavior or uh, what, it, what exactly you want them to do, and helps them walk away remembering that. So I started this talk by telling you about how flawed and uh, deficient our human brains are. But I'd like to end the talk by reminding you all of just how unique and special they are, too. One of the main assertions of the book Sapiens that I really love is that of all the animals on the planet, we are the only species that lives in a dual reality. On one hand, we have this physical reality, you know, the stage, the air that we're breathing, smoke floating around in front of me. And on the other hand, we have this reality that we have constructed from the stories that we tell ourselves and that we collectively believe. And these are things like money and nations and religion and Brexit. <laughs> but it is actually this uh, unique trait of humans, this ability to construct our own reality around us, that gives us this ability to you know, cooperate together flexibly but in very large numbers. And that's something that no other animal on the planet can do. And it's something that has given us the ability to create these amazing technologies that our ancestors could never have dreamed of. As an entrepreneur or a leader or even just a manager of a small team trying to build a new product, your job is to tell stories. You have to construct stories that help align people around not only what it is you want to build, but also how it, you are going to go about building that and what things are important to you as a group. So if you take away nothing else from this talk, if you take away not even half of it, but only just a tiny fraction of it, I hope that you all leave here feeling able to tell better stories and actually go out and try really hard to tell all sorts of stories, your story, but also the story of your products and your teams and your companies. Thank you. <laughs>